Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Welcome, everyone, and good morning to all of you on this glorious Easter morning. A special word of welcome to our guests and visitors. Uh, we're thrilled that you're here, and we're so happy to be together to celebrate God's name today. Just a couple of logistical things to mention before we start. One is that in place of the fellowship pads, we're using these welcome cards. We ask that you, that everybody who's here, whether you're a member, a friend, a visitor, uh, you're only here once, uh, whatever it may be, just to take a look, fill it out, and put it in the baskets that are by the entrance to the narthex outside. Uh, it just enables us to serve you better. Also, during communion today, we will be doing a continuous distribution. So we just ask that you follow the instructions of the ushers. They will guide and direct you as needed. Now, with that, I invite you to stand as we begin with our Easter morning worship. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. We sound our Easter greeting. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In baptism, your old sinful nature was buried with Christ when he died. When God the Father brought him back to life again, you were given his wonderful new life to enjoy. To remind ourselves of what happens at our baptism, we speak the words that were spoken at our baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please face the cross as we begin with our processional hymn.
victory, by his death and resurrection, we come before him to confess our sins and hear his word of forgiveness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. abundant mercy has given us new birth into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, to an inexpressible and glorious joy in him, to whom with you, O Father, and you, O Holy Spirit, one blessed Trinity, be ascribed all honor, might, majesty, and power forever. Amen. You may be seated.
The Old Testament reading for today from Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Epistle Reading from 1 Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
front or back, right? <laughs> I invite you to stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. <clears throat> and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Have a seat. Did you hear? God's throwing a party. There's going to be amazing wine and the best choices of meat. And everybody's invited. That means you and I are invited too. This party has come as you are. It's really more of an open bar feast, not a potluck. There's nothing you have to bring. There's no gift for the host. There's no expectations of something on your part once it's over for some future day. This party will be on that future day. It will be the end of all parties. It will be the final word. And no matter what your idea of a great party is, whether it's time outside, barbecue with child care provided, or intimate conversation with some friendly and, and wonderful acquaintances over hors d'oeuvres, you know, in a quiet place with an adult beverage, or whether it's just simply gathering with your favorite people informally around the TV, whatever it is, this party will be the best party ever. Oh yeah, and by the way, at this party, we will experience the death of death. God will swallow up death. God will swallow up the shroud. God will wipe away the tears from all faces. God will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth forever. The prophet Isaiah was God's mouthpiece for that promise 700 years before Jesus arrived on the scene. And 2,000 years later, as we gather here, as we hear and live as people enlivened by that promise, as we hear the testimony of those who witnessed his resurrection, as we map out that future for ourselves as people whose lives have been changed by the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, we take part in an everlasting hope that no one and nothing can overcome. Though that party to end all parties will be amazing. You and I are two names that never should have been on that guest list in the first place. But we are. All because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, the words death has been swallowed up in victory will come to pass for us too. Because of Jesus, our voices too will cry, this is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in the gift of our salvation. Death swallowed up. Oh no, that's a switch, isn't it? Usually it's death that does the swallow. And usually it's you and me and people we love that are the ones being swallowed. Anybody seen any of the Dune franchise? Dune Part 2 is the most recent film. Julie and I had a chance to see it a few weeks ago. It's quite a spectacle. The sandworms in that movie are death personified. Now sandworms, if you're not familiar with the term, are fictional creatures. They live and swim through the sand on the planet Arrakis. And they just so often will come up to the surface and gobble down any poor soul that's gotten in the way of their territory. And it's not something you forget soon after you see it in, on the big screen. When I was a young person growing up, you might say the movie Jaws and the great white shark in that movie had a kind of similar role for me. I remember one entire summer when it was hard to go to the beach and just be in the water because I'd seen that movie not long before. But whether it's a sandworm or a shark or some other special effects creature that Hollywood is going to come up with, all depict the unexpected and the overpowering nature of death. Ordinary flesh and blood doesn't stand a chance in the face of death. And it's like that mysterious creature Leviathan in the Old Testament. Leviathan is that serpent or dragon or we're not really sure what it is exactly, but it hides in some far, dark, removed recess of the sea until it gets stirred up 
And when it gets stirred up, watch out. God is the only one who can persevere against it. Death is like that. Death teaches us to brace ourselves for its impact. Death is eventually something that will take down the people who are closest to us, and we know that. One day we see them, we hear them talking, we hear them laughing, we hear them singing, maybe we even hear them dancing or see them dancing, and the next day they're no longer with us. They're gone. Swallowed up. And what about us? We might not be the ones swallowed up, at least not yet, but when the people we love depart, death will take a big bite out of us, just the same. The script that you and I and all of Isaiah's first listeners write about death is that death swallows us up. Jesus, the beloved Son of God, was God's way of flipping that script. It was never a part of God's original plan that humankind should ever have to encounter that monster death. That was the outcome of the first man and first woman's disobedience, as you'll recall. Disobedience that all humanity ever since has taken part in. Disobedience against God. And so God's plan from the very beginning was to rescue Adam and Eve and all humankind through one of their descendants. And he promised as much. One who would overcome the serpent. You hear it, you see that promise of God again coming to the surface when we hear and we read about Abraham and how God called Abraham, though Abraham was an idol worshiper. And God promised Abraham that through his descendants, all nations, all nations of the world would come into God's blessing. All of it is a kind of prelude for what we find and read in Isaiah today. And then, get to the New Testament and Jesus Christ appears on the scene. Jesus, true God and true man, made it clear not once, not twice, but three times that he was aligned with this perfect plan of God to rescue humanity. To flip the script that humanity had come to know. Make no mistake... Jesus would indeed die. Death would swallow him up too. His body would be wrapped in a linen shroud and placed into a cold, dark tomb. But on the third day, Jesus would rise just as he said. Jesus would be the victorious one over sin, death, and the devil. And because he died and lives in our hearts today, he is the way we come to know about God's eternal plan for salvation for ourselves and for the world. And he gives us a new recognition of what it means to be alive, to live by God's mercy and grace. That big party, that grand celebration that was foretold by Isaiah the prophet, is, of course, based on the fact that on that day, God will swallow up death forever. But as Reed Blessing, former seminary professor at Concordia Seminary, once pointed out, before something is swallowed up, it must be tasted. And in Hebrews we read, Jesus suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death forever. Jesus did just that. But that's not all. Not only did Jesus taste death, he took the cup of obedience to the Father, the cup of God's wrath for sin, the cup of eternal death and damnation that you and I deserve, and he swallowed it up. He drained it to the last drop. Now Jesus is life overriding death. Jesus is making all things new. We haven't yet seen death swallowed up in victory. We have not yet experienced that direct interaction of God with us as he wipes the tears from our faces. But now as we see Jesus as the victorious Lord of life, 
we reread his words and we see in them the importance and the message they have for us in our everyday, day-to-day -day living. We cling to those words of our Lord. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not be hungry. Whoever comes to me will never be thirsty. Words where Jesus promises, I am the good shepherd. I came that my sheep might have life and have it abundantly. Words that bring us an impenetrable and bulletproof hope. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall live. Being people of faith doesn't take away the pain of separation. Separation we feel from those we love when they're no longer alive with us as they once were. But what Easter shows us is that God has flipped the script of our human expectation. In Jesus, death has been swallowed up. In Jesus, our reproach has been taken away. And yes, though we don't yet see it with our own eyes, that day is coming. One day when we will experience it as we experience the resurrection of our own bodies. As we experience our loving God wiping away the tears from all of our faces. That first Easter was so unexpected. The women at the tomb, those devoted women who came to anoint Jesus' body, could only run away in fear and surprise. But as the risen Christ appeared to over 500 witnesses, and don't think that wasn't so that some people could check it out and see if it was fake news. Not only did he appear to 500 witnesses, the message of Jesus Christ risen would travel from one person to another until it had encompassed the whole world. Nothing would ever be the same again. Easter's not quite the gift-giving the gift -giving and card-giving time of year that Christmas is, but this year Julie and I got some Easter cards, and they were really quite special. One had a message that was memorable because it was so short, and I'd just like to share it with you. It was simply this. He is risen. He promised it. They witnessed it. We live it. Don't you love that? I mean, what more do you have to say? <laughs> it says it all. And we see it happening right in our, in our Bible readings for today. In the Old Testament message, the promise was made. It had been made before, but it was made again. In the New Testament epistle reading, we hear St. Paul's testimony, and we know there were many, many others who testified to it too. And what about that living it part? Well, you know what? Pastor Zach, Pastor Ellen, and I see you guys living out Easter joy each and every day. That's right, congregation of people here at Resurrection Lutheran Church, many of you carry the burden of illness that you're undergoing a little lighter because you have that hope that says one day there's a party coming. Those of you that have had to say goodbye to dearly departed friends and family recently have demonstrated gratitude for the gift of the faith of loved ones who you say have left behind a legacy of how to live with an undying hope for them and their descendants. We see the lives of this congregation dedicated in serving others at home, at work, and in the community. And we see people here today and week after week celebrating that gift of Easter joy and life with the crescendo of their singing and also in the quiet places of their homes bringing their earnest petitions to God in prayer too. Easter is what makes life worth living. And the risen Christ is at work in you. He's at work in me to live it out. Yeah, God promised us a party to end all parties at the end of time. And we don't yet join in on that party, at least not completely. All is not yet consummated. But even from here, even on this Easter morning, it's almost like you can hear the laughter and the sound of conversation, can't you? coming from the place where that party is going to go on. 
It's almost like you can smell that savory meat getting cooked a few blocks away. It's close. It's within reach. All of which is to say that the promises of God made real in Christ Jesus are real for you and me because of his word, which we cling to in faith. And so it's not going too far to practice those words that the people at the big party are going to say one day. I invite you to do that with me. Say after me, this is the Lord. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We have waited for him. Let us be glad. And rejoice in our salvation. And rejoice in our salvation. Gathered as table again today, we have a foretaste of the feast to come. And yes, we look forward to the joy of that day one day. But we live in the moment of the resurrected Christ who lives in our hearts by his grace and mercy, who confirms that faith in his word and leads us to a hope that can never be broken time and time again. For neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God who swallows up death forever in Christ Jesus our Lord. We cling to his promises. We rejoice in his salvation. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. I invite the congregation to stand as together we affirm our faith with the exclamation explanation of the second article of the Apostles' Creed. We say together, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. The peace of the Lord be with you. Go ahead and greet those around you this morning with that resurrection piece. Once you've got everyone around you, you can go ahead and take a seat as we continue with our offering hymn and also the gathering of our offering.
I invite you to stand as we continue with the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and praise for your sacrificial death and your glorious resurrection. That by your death, or death and resurrection, you have victory over sin, death, and the devil. And you have brought us into that victory by our baptisms, Lord. Because we are washed clean of our sins, and now we have died and rose again with you in the waters of baptism. We know what we have to look forward to. That death is swallowed up in your victory. And we look forward to that glorious, eternal banquet feast to come because of your work alone for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, because of your glorious work and because we know what we have to look forward to, Lord, use us to continually proclaim that glorious, awesome word to those that you place before us. Lord, we all have people in our lives that don't know that gospel love, that don't know that promise. So please use us, Lord. Embolden our faith. Give us strength and confidence and the words to say, to speak this gospel truth and love into the lives that you give before us, so that they too may have a seat at that banquet table. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, as we continue to journey towards that eternal banquet feast, we continue to walk through the trials and hardships of this world. And Lord, sometimes those struggles, they can be overwhelming. Lord, no matter what we may face, may you be with us through this journey as we continue to, to journey through as sojourners in this world, waiting for that feast. Lord, especially, we want to bring before you those that we hold near and dear on our hearts, Anne, Patricia, Joanne, and Fern, and all those that we name before you silently at this time. Lord, we ask that you hear our prayer. Hear these names, that you may bring them comfort and peace and healing according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Into your hands, O God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
Until we join in that everlasting feast, we live in hope. We lean on God's word and we celebrate today and share the celebration with others too. Receive his benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.